We will. Uh, we won't pass the offering plates today. We'll kind of take a break from that, but that doesn't mean you know ignore it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the plates are no. The plates are out there. Please drop your offering in there. Uh, online giving is available. It's been available for a while. On the bottom of our website, at the bottom, it says give. On the mobile app, you can give through that. There's ways you can participate that way uh, if if you prefer. But uh, appreciate that, and thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord in uh, in that. So then, would you turn with me to Job, chapter 35. Continuing in our series here, Let's see if I can get there. So you normally I have a few seconds in the front row there to get my, my act together and all that stuff, but it's okay. Job. Chapter 35, when my boys, my boys were younger, they had a rather difficult time getting into the water. You ever have kids like that? I, uh, interesting thing is we lived on Cape Cod at the time, and there was water literally everywhere. You had fresh water and salt water and just water all around you. And uh, the problem that they had, though, was that if they couldn't touch the bottom, they would panic. So we would go to the ocean, or we'd go to the bay side there, and we'd let them go, and they would have a good time. They have no problem with that. But you'd take them to a pool, and they would grab on to Dad for dear life. They can control the depth in the ocean, so to speak, even though it's bigger. It seems much scarier, but the pool was a lot worse for them. Now, the only one of my kids that didn't really mind that was Claire. She'd just jump in, whether there was a person there to catch her or not. And... Uh, Thankfully, we always did catch her. But so what would happen is I would carry them around. Of course, I would hold them in the water, you know, and they would do fine. And then I thought, hey, we're getting a little more brave. Let me just see if I can hold them a little further away, and maybe I'll turn them around so they can kind of see where they're going. And you would have think, you would have thought that I had thrown them into the ocean with a bunch of sharks swimming around them. The reaction to that, right? It's panic. I can't see. I'm, I'm, I can't feel my, the bottom. I, I'm, I'm nervous. I can't do this. And they would panic, and they would panic, and we would go through this back and forth, grab my body, grab my neck, that kind of thing again and again, over and over again, until finally they got old enough, and they uh, were able to, to process and understand that a little better, that Dad wasn't going to let them drown, and uh, not, um, you know, not at least not all the way, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But isn't that how we kind of start off on things in life? I mean, it's, it's kind of like that, right? We, we want to do things on our own. We want to kind of jump in and be a part of it. Most people are not necessarily like Claire, just jump off and leave caution to the wind, so to speak. Um, most people want to sort of figure it out, feel it out, kind of get a feel for how we're going to go about it. And our minds have all kinds of fears, and we have scenarios and what-ifs and, and things that we just don't know what's going to happen. And if I go all in on this, is it going to be okay? Am I going to survive? Is it, uh, what's going to happen? The thing about it is I, I love that as a visual because God has, not, God has not made us to be what we'd call shallow and Christians. Where we're not supposed to always feel the bottom, so to speak, of the pool. But at the same time, we're not just thrown in and said, oh, good luck, figure it out, how to learn how to swim. There is a process that God goes through to help teach us and learn us, le teach us how to trust him, and we learn how to trust him in a, in a more specific and real way. And when we feel overwhelmed, he holds us. And when there's times that we get scared and we uh, need to take a break, he lets us do that. Or when we get too confident and we start to drown, he helps us in that as well. And there's lots of different scenarios that that takes place. There's times look at, I look at the world and the mission of the church and, and I get scared because it's a lot and there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of scariness and, and just variables. I'd rather be safe. I'd rather not have to deal with pain and difficulty and I think we all can relate. But that's not how life is. We have doubts. We have fears. We fear we're like, feel like we're sinking. We feel like we're desperate. We feel like we're panicking. Right now, with uh, uh, this COVID-19 virus, people are panicking. There's fear. There's some, some rational things, some irrational things. And it's times like that that we try to do things on our own, and perhaps a little more than we should, and we fail because we can't control it. We need the Lord to intervene. As we live our life, our goal is to live our life to the glory of God. 
every part of our lives, every part of our being being something that is for his glory. Every time I cling to the edge of the pool, so to speak, because I'm scared, or every time I have a crisis, or every time I feel good and I have a, a joyful time, all of it for his glory. He holds us, even when the waves seem to be too much and the winds seem to be too much. He holds us when we feel like he's no longer holding us. He holds us when we don't, uh, we don't think we even feel like being held. It's about what God does in our lives. All of it for his glory. In Job chapter 35, this is the second part of Elihu's speech. We saw a little bit about him last Sunday. Um, the youngest of the friends, he waited to speak until they were all done. And he makes assumptions about Job that aren't exactly accurate, but he has a lot of truth in his young life. And the underlying thought for us today is really this. The goal of my life, the goal of your life, the goal of all of this is to glorify God. We want to glorify God in all things. The goal of the church, glorify God by making disciples. That's the mission of the church. So how can I glorify God in this? How can I make much of God in my life? Whatever that looks like for you, whatever your circumstances are, what does that look like? It might be different for the person next to you than it is for you. But whatever it is, I know the Holy Spirit has something for us as we lean in and open our hearts to him. So let's really read part of this here. Job 35, 1 through 11. And just follow along and, and we'll, we'll pick this apart a little bit this morning. Then Elihu said... Do you think this is just? You say I will be cleared by God, yet you ask him, what profit is it to me? And what do I gain by not sinning? I would like to reply to you and to your friends with you. Look up at the heavens and see. Gaze at the clouds so high above you. If you sin, how does that affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him, or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects only a man like yourself, and your righteousness only the sons of men. Men cry out under a load of oppression. They plead for relief from the arm of the powerful. But no one says, where is God my maker? Who gives songs in the night? Who teaches more to us than to the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the air? So living your life to the glory of God means a few different things here. Well, first of all, here's the first one. Giving to the Lord his rightful place in your life results in your own good. Verse 5, I, I love it how he starts this off. Verse 5, look up at the heavens and see. Are you able to perceive it if you look up at the sky? Can you see everything clearly with your eye? The answer is no. We have telescopes. Big telescopes <coughs> that help us see far away. That even uh, with those telescopes, however, we cannot see at all. There is much that we cannot see. You look at the sky and the vastness of the universe and, and you feel small, and you should, because it's very big. But here's what it says, Psalm chapter 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Think about that. The heavens. If you look at <clears throat> all that we can see and can't see, the universe, how as big as it is and as far as it goes, he says, you have set your glory above the heavens. God has his glory. His glory is above the heavens. It exceeds it beyond anything our eyes could perceive or can't perceive. There's no end. The glory is infinite like he is. And so it stands to reason as Elihu puts it here in this text, it's likely that you don't know everything. <laughs> even if your eyes perceived it. Even if you think you have your life, life figured out. You think you know what God is doing. Even then, we only see a small part of what he's doing. <clears throat> and even so, we often need glasses to see and things to look through in order to make, make sense of it. We have a limited understanding. We see just a small window. And so we must give the Lord his rightful place in our lives as king, as Lord, as God, as the one we surrender our lives to in all things so that he gets the glory and he does the good in our lives. 
A part of that is treating sin as offensive. Sin must be offensive. As offensive as avoiding a virus. We sanitize, we wash hands, we, we avoid contact, we do all these things to try to avoid getting sick, and we do it every year, right? Not just for this virus, but for the, the flu and all the things that go around. How much more must we avoid that disease of our soul, the, the sin that weighs on us and hurts, our, hurts us, kills us? Job was perceived by Elihu as saying that well, why do I bother not to sin? Why do I bother to avoid the evil that's around us? Why do I bother not just to, to have a good time with everybody else? What do I gain by not sinning? I'm pure and close to God, and yet I still suffered like a sinner. Now, those words were put in his mouth. He didn't really say that, but it's a good point. Because the appeal of sin is, hey, you know what? The world is going this way. It's popular. It feels good. It looks fun. Let's just, what's the big deal? Human nature says, hey, sin is, sin is going to fulfill that need in your life. So hard to stay away from it. But sin is the problem. Sin is the problem we've had all along. It's why the world is the way it is. It's why we have disease and death. Sin brings baggage. It weighs us down. It instills fear in our lives. It makes us stop doing what God wants to do in favor of our own flesh and what we think we need not so much what he wants to do. Isaiah, um, excuse me, Isaiah. Isaiah's coming a little later. But I'll get to Isaiah in a second. My life is for his glory. The battle is, is very real. The allure of sin is real. The purpose that we have in life is to give God glory, right? But, this, but the sin that comes in, that takes glory from God. One of the big examples in the world, of course, is in every aspect of life, it's not just the church, it's workplace, it's homes, is gossip, slander, things we say, things we speak about other people or with other people, unwholesome talk, tongues on fire with words that should not be spoken about. If we live our life to the glory of God, sin, whatever that sin is, must be offensive. We must feel that, know that, understand that this is not right. I want to get rid of this. This needs to go. Because sin affects how clearly people see God's glory. They get an incorrect view of God. We're told, as the church, we love each other. And then if we hurt each other, that sends a mixed message of the world. In Ephesians 4.29, Paul writes, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. This is a great one, by the way, you can use with your kids. But, and adults, but I'm just saying, it's good for kids. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It's a huge issue. We need to pay attention. That's just one example of many, many, many. But God needs to be on the throne of my life and your life. One of the big takeaways here. Uh, Elihu tells Job is in light of all that God is and how high above everything he is, you have no business trying to walk through your life without yielding your plans to him. Yield your life to him. Yield your fears and your insecurities to him. There's no reason to try to face the world without the assurance of, of his presence in your life because he said he would be present in your life. If you ask him, if you lean in, if you receive him, Living life to the glory of God means giving the Lord the rightful place in your life. And it results in, yes, changing things in your life, but ultimately for your own good. Saving you from headaches and pains and things that happen when we just plow through and do our own thing and don't pay attention to what God says. Another takeaway here for us in this is that the, to knowing, knowing sin and sin's impact on us does not change God, but it does change you. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, if sin, if you sin, how does that affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what, what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects only a man like yourself, and your righteousness only the sons of men. So Elihu is getting at this unchanging nature of God, that God shows mercy to you and he's not persuaded by you to love you because he just he does. He gives you mercy not because you persuade him because he wants to. 
God judges you not because he has been injured by you, but because his standards are firm and impartial and, and uninfluenced. And it's his, he's holy. And so there's this space, right, between us and between God. A vast space that was only able to be bridged by Jesus Christ. He makes God accessible to us. Sin does take and create that divide. Hard to try to cover that divide and earn our way. We can't do it. And people have tried this all throughout the years. In fact, you go back to, I won't put this up on the screen, but, but Genesis. Back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. I'll leave this here. So I, Genesis chapter 11. Here's the tower, the tower of Babel, right? The Tower of Babel, what, what did they do? They tried to make a name for themselves and be God. It says here, Now the whole world had one language and common speech, and, and uh, they found a plain and they settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and, and bake them thoroughly. And they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to the heavens, that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. There's a divide, and they're trying to reach it. God sees this. It says, verse 5, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. We're building. So God comes to them, and he meets them in this, and what does he do? He scatters them. Why? It was for their own good. Because they, they needed not to be in control, to not be their own God. To not, they would have rebelled and ignored him if they would have, he would just let them go. So God is always intervening. He's always coming into lives and helping us to see the path and what we should be living and how we should be doing it. If you think back to the pool uh, for a minute and me holding my kids in the pool. I mean, what does it take for God to hold on to you? It takes closeness, intimacy. We call that intimate space, right? That God chooses to enter this intimate space to be with you. It's critically important as we look at uh, the way sin affects us and the way it affects those in the church. We've uh, often had experiences and seen people, maybe you've been one of them, who've been abused or injured Obviously, that's, you know, that's devastating, terrible things. Why did God allow you to get hurt? Why does God allow these things to happen? Why is my loved one sick? And why is there violence around us? And why, why, why? Why won't you do something, God? And guess what? We are reminded again and again that God did do something. That he has not ignored. That God came to restore what was broken. It's, it's horrible if you've been hurt. It's horrible if you've, if you've experienced uh, some terrible things in your life. But, and, but we take, good, uh, we take uh, uh, comfort in knowing that Jesus Christ also was hurt. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was hung between criminals. God did that because the space between God and man was never going to be bridged by our own good deeds. It just wasn't going to happen. We couldn't do it. Unless someone paid for the sins of mankind... It was not going to happen. And so someone had to make a way, and God made a way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, it says in Scripture, right? John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I love this, too. This is great. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. There's a good uh, takeaway for us. The author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How could there possibly be joy in the cross? The joy set before him was the cross. Well, what was that all about? Why was he joyful in the cross? That hurts. We see it in Scripture. He was in anguish over this. This was not easy. What was the joy? The joy is the relationship that was being restored. You and me. Like a proud dad with pictures of their kids. You know, it's like, I'm doing this for them. I'm doing this for you. And so we look at our lives and, and we see that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain, in the midst of trials, in the midst of everything, we have a God who understands. We have a God who has gone there. We have, gone, we have a God who has taken our sin and paid the penalty for it. So sin does not change God. God does uh, choose to be affected by it. He does choose to enter in and, and redeem us in it. He didn't have to do that. 
He could have said, you guys rebelled, you're on your own. But he didn't because he loves us so much and he can't help himself but to love us. That's who he is. So we need to let that sink in a little bit, especially in this season as we lead into Easter coming up in a few weeks. So to be reminding ourselves, hey, you know what? He loves us enough that he would die. He would suffer. He would be rejected. The Easter song this year that we're singing is, is really an appropriate one for this season. I didn't really know that coming into this, but uh, the song is Rise and Be Healed. And the whole idea is, is that uh, Jesus, of course, is our healer, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, in all ways. And that's what I was going to reference Isaiah, because Isaiah, Isaiah 53, familiar but so powerful. We just got to keep reminding ourselves of these things. Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Your sin will kill you, but it will not change God. So we need to deal with it on the cross. And that's what he did. And that's what he gives us. And that's what we can do. That's the good news for us. To live life for his glory. We can't control tomorrow. We can't control today. But we can go to him and we can give him our lives. We can live for him. And so then there's this searching for the good to be gained in our suffering. Verse 9 says, Men cry out under a load of oppression. They plead for relief from the arm of the powerful. But... But no one says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night, who teaches more to us than to the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the air. See, Job has not gotten there just yet. In a few weeks we'll see this. Elihu encourages him not to simply complain, but to ask God. God, what is your purpose? Give me your purpose. I want to gain in this suffering. So many times we don't even ask what God might want to teach us in it, we just complain about it. But if we look past the wretchedness of our own condition, we can see God. His issues are bigger than anything we've ever experienced. We can lose sight of God and we can think, oh boy, there's, there's more in front of me today than I can ever face. How am I going to see any good in this? How am I going to find anything to redeem? We get depressed and we miss out on what he's doing. But God has shown me in the past, and again this week, uh, as I was just praying and considering uh, what's all going on, a helpful lesson from David and Goliath. Very simple story. Remember the story, right? You got a scrawny guy, okay, insert me. Scrawny guy, David, who's uh, uh, been called to go and defeat this Goliath. Who wants to be Goliath? Never mind. No volunteers, Jeff, Goliath? Goliath doesn't have a good part in the story because he loses, so um, maybe don't want to be Goliath. But uh, anyway, so th- you know, th- you see this happen, right? First Samuel seventeen. David is given this task, and the people kind of go, "All right, David, well, see you later," and they're gone. And so David has to fight this big, big guy. And so what does he do? You remember the story. What does he do? He go. He goes. And he, does it say he just kind of timidly approaches him? No, what does it say in the text? If you read it, it says, he ran towards him. That's crazy. What's wrong with you, David? David runs to meet him. He runs toward the obstacle. Why did he do that? It says in the text, because he was looking to God, because he knew who was on his side. The almighty God was on his side. And the rest of the story is history. He takes a stone and he wraps it around. And what does that song go? One little stone goes up in the air and the giant came tumbling down. Right? We get things like that in our lives. We feel like they're Goliaths. They're too big. I, I don't know how I'm going to get past this. And in some ways, I think our, our nation is feeling that way right now with a, a virus that's unknown in terms of what it's going to do. But the word is still the same, isn't it? Do not be afraid because you come against this in the name of the Lord Almighty. 
We look past the challenges of life. Maybe it's a job challenge. Maybe it's a family challenge. Maybe it's a sin thing that's weighing you down. And we go, I, I can't get past this. I can't seem to break this. But we see that there's a God who is much bigger standing with you. This is for his glory. Your suffering is for his glory. All of these things we go through leads to his glory. But we've got to try to see what the good is in it. Try to see what he's doing in it. Because he is present. Sometimes mysterious. I get that. Sometimes we don't get it. I understand. But we look to God. We keep doing that. Another point here Elihu makes, he says, when you go to God, don't go to him with a complaining cry, but go to him with a praying cry. There's a difference. We cry in our oppression. We complain without any direction, just kind of whine, whine, whine. But Elihu reminds us that we've been given much more. A mind, an ability to understand, an ability to, to learn and see God as God, to know him as God, to take it to him in prayer, not with this you know, fancy words and thee, thou, all those things, but just to communicate with God and to say, God, I want a relationship with you. And I'd like you to speak into my life. I'd like you to show me in your word how I can ground myself in this and how I can process these things and how I can seek you in the midst of turmoil and trouble. Because he gives us his word, opportunity to glorify him in the middle of anything. It's a platform we can live on. He can be magnified in it. But it does involve waiting. I understand that. It involves waiting and trust. It involves humility. It involves surrender. So how do we glorify God in all these things? And again, I don't know what that means for you. I've used a couple examples, but it might be something completely different. How do we glorify God? How do, we give my, how do I give my life for his glory? It's easier said than done. We have insecurities and doubts and fears, and yet we need to remember that Jesus does in fact love us and he is with us. How do I show him in school? How do I show him my family? How do I help my neighbors and my friends and everybody around me who is fearful today that there is a God who loves them? It could be a time for you to let Jesus take hold of your life again. Maybe you felt like you've kind of gone off on your own a little bit. And maybe the, the path you're on is really not a path that he would have you on. And he's calling you back, and that can be a chance to, to say, you know what, I, I've done my own thing, but Lord, I need, to, I need to focus my life on you again. I need to walk faithfully with you. My life, your glory. I want to do things for your good, not for my own, but for your own good. And so we stop flailing our arms, and because we can't feel the bottom, because we can't, we can't control it, but we embrace the one who suffered to die to buy our freedom. Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life. So stop trying to do it yourself. <laughs> Job understood some of that. Elihu gave him a good word on that. And we'll see as we go forward here. Now God does respond and God does give some specific guidance for us and for him in terms of what it means to live. But God settles this in Job's heart, that God's glory is what he is after what he needs to be after, to embrace him, to look for ways, to look for the good, to, to you as the church, as part of the, the church worldwide, to, to bring glory in conversations and in ministries and in finances and in everything that you do to be a people who give God the glory in everything. Let's pray. God, you're gracious to us. We're so glad because we're not always so gracious to ourselves. We mess up, get ahead of ourselves, we panic, we forget. So forgive us for those things, Lord. We want to be people who give you the glory. Would you use us today as we surrender ourselves in fresh ways? Use us as people who give you glory in everything, who live for your glory, who don't get caught up in worldliness and in following the paths of the people around us who are, are just chasing the wind. We want to be people who are following Jesus, keeping our lives rooted, founded, firm, established in him. Recognize that there are sins that people deal with and that the, the, uh, come back again and again. It feels like they never seem to, to go. And Lord, I pray that you would give, give um, grace to those today who are struggling. With a, with a kind of a consistent sin pattern. 
Provide them ways out of that. Provide them freedom. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who releases from bondage and gets chains disappear. And may we be uh, as willing to run away from sin as we're willing to run away from germs and sickness and all those things. We, uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness in us, and we ask you again to have your way. I surrender. I pray that that be the cry of our hearts today. We surrender. Surrender our lives to you in all things. We praise your name today, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to conclude our service here with a song.